Christ equals mc squared, part two, Adidas Samaraj. Can you conceive of the madness of such a universe as this? First nothing, and then all this, this apparent world, seemingly mechanical, in which every individual element or entry is, in itself, mortal, a world that seems to afford no opportunity for any individual to know anything about what is beyond and prior to his or her own actual physical form or process. What an absurdity to appear out of nothing. Why should anything appear at all? Why should such a, such a joke appear out of nothing? Where has all of this happened? All of this seems to me to be very important for us to consider to the point of certainty and self-surrender. The intensity of our understanding of these matters will most definitely determine the quality of our lives. And how do you intend to get to the foundation of this wondering? If the universe is simply mad, and if there is no way to understand it, no way even to feel back beyond the appearance of your own nervous system and body, any more than you can feel back beyond the Big Bang and discover how the universe came to exist. If that is the nature of existence, you see, then there are at least two basic ways whereby you can respond. Either you can become so serious that you seem not to take anything seriously at all and so just burn yourself out desiring yourself in self-indulgence or whatever chaos you want to use to distract yourself, or with equal seriousness you can approach life as the conventional Buddhists do. The classical or exoteric type of Buddhist, who should be distinguished from the esoteric or higher type of Buddhists, examples of which have appeared, for instance, among the adepts of Tibet, is responding to the same conception of the universe as the person who burns himself out. He has exactly the same motivation. The person who burns himself out does so because he cannot handle the truth that he seems to have discovered. The usual Buddhist, however, although convinced of the same truth, does not take up the way of self-indulgence in his intellectual view that is only another form of suffering. Instead, he yields all the tension in his being. He just gives up all hold of him, of him, on himself. He becomes less and less subject to the stress of living and he ultimately renounces all motivation, so that he is neither threatened nor threatening. He becomes so free of reactive stress that he is no longer struggling with this inevitable mortality. Thus he conquers the awesome facts of nature by giving up all striving in the midst of a mortal life. If you were to come to this conclusion that you are mortal, that the universe is essentially chaotic, and in any case you cannot know beyond your own nervous system, that you cannot find out the actual nature of your situation, if all that were to become your own conviction, I do not see how you could take this world unseriously, enough to quietly play out an orderly and productive ordinary life except perhaps to, to the degree that you were simply frightened. And of course, such fear is an important element of life in most of us. People are essentially desperate. They do live lives of quiet, 
desperation. They have discovered, at least in their superficial reflections and feelings, that they are mortal and hopeless, that they cannot know anything ultimately and are not congratulated by the universe. And they are afraid because they know that they can suffer terribly, so they neither burn themselves out nor yield to their mortality by giving up to the point of the Buddhist's passivity or non-resistance to change and death. Gautama, Gautama, called the Buddha, did not believe in striving toward heaven worlds. There is no traditional command in classical or original Buddhism to make efforts to succeed in mystical matters. Gautama simply ceased to be disturbed by the mortal facts of suffering. By craving experience and by craving experience and entering into the whole affair of experience, including psychic as well as physical phenomena, he found that experience itself is deluding. Experience makes us feel as if we as if we are involved in some great importance. Whereas, if we really observe ourselves, we will see that in a very few years we will start getting terribly ill and eventually we will die, losing everything and everyone in the process. Guatemala's point of view was very desperate in that sense. He saw clearly that we have riches and visions and all kinds of material blessings, but these things all become ridiculous when, when we remember that we are mortal. Guatemala's ultimate philosophical mood of non-reaction was based on the observation of his present and inevitable mortality, not on the idea of eventual immortality. He simply came to the point of yielding, of non-resistance. He could accept the view that bodily life and everything that we can have in mind is temporary and mortal, but he also realised that this life could pass without being disturbing. While alive, he engaged in no disturbing efforts to fulfil motivations and desires. He became desireless through insight into desire. Guatemala did not create any programme for going to heaven or for existing forever in any objective form. Yet the older Indian tradition of the immortal soul, of higher or heavenly worlds, and of reincarnation or transmigration, is also associated with Gautama's patterns of thought and presumption. Such traditional law, whether fanciful or factual, does not seem to fit very well with Gautama's particularly fan fantastic observation of the facts of nature. That is why so much of traditional religious Buddhism is really based on accretions, of popular nonsense, such as developed over time in the case of all ancient exoteric religious traditions. The glorious heavenly images of the Buddha that have appeared within the later traditions of Buddhism have nothing to do with the original root of inspired intuition that awakened in Gautama himself. The root of exoteric Buddhism is a desperate or fatalistic observation of the facts of nature which justifies the conceptual understanding that you are mortal, not that you are an immortal soul, not that there are great cosmic pos possibilities, but simply and only that you are mortal. Once this principle is accepted, anything great that may come into your experience has to be understood from that point of view, or you will be, ludic, be deluded by it. Thus, any great desire, when satisfied, can delude you by making you forget your actual situation. The more involved you become with experience, the more you crave experience, and the more you crave experience, the more you want to continue to exist, and therefore, the more you fear death. Guatemala's approach was to enjoy insight into this matter, to presume with absolute clarity simply that I am mortal. That was the great insight, 
It was not a metaphysical idea of some sort. It was a process of awakening to mortality and allowing the sheer fact of mortality to overwhelm him so that he could be liberated from the game of fulfilling all the psychophysical forms of mortal possibility. We also see a variation on the mood of this fatalistic insight in our contemporary scientific th technological culture. We are all tending to be possessed by a conception of our life and world and destiny that is based exclusively on the observation of the material and mortal facts of nature, such as the Big Bang of the birth of the physical, of the physical universe beyond, which we cannot know. When we presume that we are merely and only mortal, we also begin logically to presume other things. For instance, we may observe and negatively interpret that much of what we are considered religious, mystical and otherworldly phenomena are simply expressions of the internal, subjective and self-generated profusion of the brain and the total nervous system. How then can we avoid having to yield to the extremes of fatalistic self-abandonment rather than ecstatic, self-transcending, life-positive, loving and relational intent? Through either degenerative self-indulgence or else passive giving up in non-resistance to the mutability of the world. How can we avoid the conventional methods of either passive Buddhism or nihilistic libertism in the face of our maturing observation of the world. To enjoy spiritual insight means that one has realised what is truly transcendental, not what is merely psychic and attractive and apparently non-physical. So much of ordinary yoga and mysticism merely distracts people with intentional objects that are hyped to them as spiritual, soul-like, immortal and even divine phenomena. But internal objects are in themselves nothing more than reflections of the changes occurring in our nervous systems and the self-centred expansions of our own bodies and minds. People imagine themselves to be spiritual because they are involved in yoga, mysticism, poetic religious beliefs and the like, but truly they are in the midst of their subjective fascinations, no more spiritual or surrendered to the spirit that contains, pervades and transcends the psychophysical self than a typical Buddhist monk or an atheistic nucleus physicist or a self-indulgent man on the street. Such people are simply focusing their attention on subtler aspects of the manifest self, the mutable psychophysical being, whereas real spirituality involves direct and ecstatic or self-transcending communion with the transcendental reality. Mystics, yogis, ascetics, libertines, even ordinary religious people are merely playing with their own nervous systems, their own bodies and minds. They have not yet begun to associate with the living divine personality through the self-sacrifice that is love. How can you realise the transcendental spiritual reality, not merely your psyche, your nervous system, your internal subjectivity, but the divine and transcendental reality that is prior to you, that is prior to the event of your birth, that will continue after your death, and that is so intimately associated with you that it is you. How can you, how can you discover this transcendental reality that is to be realised at the very point where your own consciousness originates and that is greater than the manifest identity of your own psychophysical mechanism? How can you transcend the limits of your own body-mind? How can you penetrate the deluding power of your own experience? If you observe nature clearly, you will see, as Guatemala did, that your experience itself can be accounted for entirely within the limits of a mortal psychophysical description. How then will you escape the apparently nihilistic paths, either of burning yourself out by exploiting experience, 
or of analysing yourself and yielding all cravings to the point of the annihilation of experience. The way of life of a living truth is to enter into active self-sacrifice or ecstasy, to ward or into the raging transcendental person, reality or self, rather than to exercise either the exploitation or the passive yielding of your own body-mind. This is the principle of true and esoteric religious life. The body-mind must be able to function in and as such God communion at all times. Therefore, we are inherently obliged to learn all about the functional capacities of our own body-mind and we grow by stages eventually comprehending and mastering even the highest psychic and superconscious aspects of ourselves. But we must always in every present moment return to the fundamental and ecstatic action that I have described and that is generated from the root of the heart, the essential root consciousness of the psyche, the epitome of the entire body-mind. True religious practice is always to enter directly into sacrifice of the total body-mind to the transcendental reality through self-transcending love or ecstasy. That is the fundamental practice, not to enter into exploitation of the body-mind in any experiential way, active or passive, but to learn all about what is merely the body-mind so that you can surrender all of it ever more profoundly, while neither exploiting nor pro prohibiting any of it. At some stage in such hard practice you may think you are surrendering quite profoundly, since you will have come to enjoy great mystical and psychic powers in the realm of nature, but you will again realise that that into which you have been surrendering is merely another part of yourself, your own psychophysical being. Then you must surrender beyond even that into the absolute living, radiant consciousness that is the reality and truth and God and self of all. In this great spiritual process you realise that the divine reality is not only transcendental consciousness but also all-pervading and radiant force or love energy. That force is, is conducted within the great realm of nature by all the circuitries within your own body-mind and by those great circuit, circuitries within which exists your body-mind all its relations and even the totality of the manifest universe. That great life current can be felt or intuited directly as universal, all-pervading and absolute being, and it can also be felt constantly in all the specific exchanges of our experience. We can be confined or contracted upon ourselves in the midst of all of that, or we can be open, radiant, expanded, free of our reactivity, our lovelessness, our fatalistic nihilism, our self-possession. You must transcend your emotional problem, your physical problem, your sexual problem, your mental problem, your psychic problem. You must transcend all the usual and uncommon problems of unillumined man through the heartfelt sympathy of the total body-mind with that in which it inheres, that in which it is arising, that on which it depends absolutely. Live in the intuitive ecstasy of that devotion, that feeling that radiates freely from the heart. It is feeling, it is an emotional matter, breathed, felt bodily, granted by divine grace. Abiding in that practice, we depend upon and are given the spiritual revelation that transcends the body-mind. This revelation is not accounted for in the, in the conventionally ascetic and life-denying point of view of classical exoteric Buddhism, nor in the mind-worshipping otherworldliness of conventional religious and mystical esotericism, East or West nor in the self-centred, nihilistic and life-degrading point of view 
of the burnt-out man on the streets, nor in the frightened mediocrity and subhuman ordinariness of the mass populations surviving anywhere in the world. All who profess religious or spiritual aspirations must understand the life-negative and nihilistic tendency in themselves. It is not a spiritual tendency. It is, in fact, an extension of worldly reactivity, the worldly tendencies of the usual man. It is not based on the transcendental realisation of life. It is based on the presumption of certain obvious material facts in nature that support a nihilistic view of life. It is based on the illusion of matter and despair in the face of death. The truly religious and spiritual way also does not involve strategic development of the great soul within, or presuming that your inner being, if only it can be separated from your body, is a great immortal individual. Rather, true spiritual understanding involves the recognition of all experience, even the most glorious mystical raptures of the inner soul, as a limit upon the infinite expanse of the heart's natively ecstatic feeling. Even so, such recognition is not nihilistic and matter-renouncing. Rather, it is founded on ecstatic and radical intuition of the paradox that even the body is consciousness, light, energy, bliss, love and transcendental radiance prior to all the seriousness of self and world. Such recognition occurs within the condition of God communion. Transcendental ecstasy, the truly spiritual state of awareness, awakened by the grace of the living God. The limited being is naturally moved to give itself up to what is truly great, and therefore only what is great is ultimately realised to exist whatever may arise as experience. Religion must be founded upon the living truth. However, the so-called great world religions are, in their exclusive and exoteric forms, not founded on devotion to the highest and universal spiritual truth. We have just considered classical or exoteric Buddhism, and we should understand that it is not at its root founded on a truly spiritual realisation of life. It is founded on a serious or even desperate interpretation of certain observations about the mortal physics of nature. Other religions such as Christianity and popular Hinduism, which are founded on the doctrine of the inner soul and the idea of God as a creator, separate creator, are in fact based on illusions of the nervous system or the internal, subjective and apparently non-physical aspect of the body-mind, as well as the illusion of matter. Thus, the real spiritual revelation is still essentially hidden within, if not absent, from the so-called great religions, although it has been at least implied by the dem demonstrative lives of great adepts, among whom, paradoxically, we should include Guatemala, Jesus, Krishna and countless others. But the spiritual truth of the living reality must be the foundation and essential revelation of core and core of practice of any true religion. If any religious or spiritual way is true, then it necessarily involves the disposition of ecstatic self-release into the living divine personality that is the condition and self of all beings and worlds. However, the mere verbal recommendation of such a disposition sounds like a conventional downtime religious message. Therefore, you must enter into the thorough and total psychophysical consideration of spiritual truth, and you must come to understand the whole affair of your life, of religion, of emotion, and of consciousness before you can truly become the devotee of the living personality of God. Otherwise, to consider devoting yourself to God is nothing more than a superficial religious idea. You must be truly serious 
and therefore profoundly and intensely free of humorous about this consideration. Because you must discriminate between your own limited experience and the ecstatic intuition of the transcendental divine reality. Otherwise, you will never find your way out of the maze of conventional awareness. You must find the spiritual reality, the living spirit, person and self. You must be devoted to the truth that includes and transcends you. Therefore, you must thoroughly investigate, consider and inquire your own actual circumstance your born situation, your fundamental existence, the whole event of your experience. And ultimately, you must come to the certain understanding that your entire existence is only summarised in ecstatic love of the living God. You must become committed to a life of active, practical and esoteric devotion to God, there is no other way to live and be happy and peaceful and sane. Yeah.